Well, let's get started. Uh, try and stay to time. I know lunch is coming up, but I want to thank Marissa, Fadi, and the Biocrates team for making this happen. And of course, everybody else who um, is here in person as well as virtually that has stayed. Um, I, uh, yeah, let's see if we can get this going. So this is the title, um, Targeted Metabolomic Profiles Among Patients with Genetically Confirmed Familial Hypercholesterolemia and Dyslipidemia. So most of our work now is really patient facing. We're really interested in using mass spectrometry and biomarkers uh, as biomarkers to, uh, or to search for biomarkers to, to either diagnose diseases or predict uh, their outcomes in response to therapies, um, which is uh, a goal of you know, uh, our group. Um, sorry, I want to go back and also acknowledge some of these other co-authors here, Karel Kalecki, uh, Sean Wang, and Christian Teskon, and P Dr. Peter McCullough, who is the clinician and provided the samples. Um, but uh, I wanted to just uh, acknowledge these people up front for their, you know, we all work together on this project. And we're all here at Baylor Scott and White. Um, so just as a quick introduction, uh, dyslipidemia and hypercholesterolemia are uh, disorders that are classified or the internet, they have ICD codes that are, you know, the International uh, Classification of Diseases Code by the World Health Organization. They actually have two different codes. Although the terms are used interchangeably, uh, but dyslipidemia is actually uh, classified as an unspecified disorder of lipoprotein metabolism and other lipidemias, having high levels of LDL, low density lipoproteins, or low levels of HDL, high density lipoproteins, high levels of triglyceride, and high cholesterol, which actually refers to the high LDL and triglyceride levels. On the other hand, hypercholesterolemia is really classified as an elevation of total cholesterol and or low density uh, lipoprotein cholesterol in the blood. And as I said, these are interchangeable terms. So, you know, they, they, but they have two different diagnostic uh, codes. And, and so, um, you know, when, when they are going, when you're getting screened or if you have, you know, uh, been seen by a vascular uh, 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 physician, you know, he could, you know, label you as either one of these. And there is, you know, some, there are subtle differences, but they do overlap, obviously. Um, so what are the clinical manifestations of dyslipidemia and hypercholesterolemia? Uh, these are kind of well-established coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, and uh, aortic aneurysm. But by far, coronary artery disease, which is the most common is, uh, in terms of uh, chronic heart disease, is uh, actually very common. It's killing over 360,000 people. Uh, these are statistics from the U.S., um, and 18.2 million adults over the age of 20 have coronary artery disease, and two in 10 deaths happen in adults less than 65 years old. So it's not just focused, it's not just in age, it, is, uh, it does affect younger people. Um, the major cause of coronary artery disease is, uh, is, is atherosclerosis, which is a process that's characterized by this sub endothelial lipid retention and inflammation primarily driven by the LDL cholesterol levels, which form these plaques and accumulate in the vessels, and then eventually uh, grow big enough to cause a, a, a thrombotic event there that can erupt, and, and, uh, and that's where you have, uh, which can be fatal. So um, clinically, there are limits that describe uh, the levels that should be either optimal, uh, near optimal or above optimal, borderline or high or very high levels of LDLC. And of course, you know, the risk increases as you go up those limits. Um, what we all want to be obviously is in the uh, optimal range, but that's, that's not uh, possible for everybody. And it doesn't seem to be at least. Um, and lowering cholesterol is, is the main objective in trying to reduce the atherosclerosis that occurs. So these are the drugs that are used, mostly the widely ones, the ones that are used most widely are statins, but there are others like the cholesterol absorption inhibitors, bile acid sequestrants, PSK9 inhibitors, which target the LDL receptor, and fibrics and niacin and also omega-3 fatty acids, uh, ethylesters. <clears throat> so the statins, which are actually the widest used, um, only really decrease LDLC levels by 51.2% in one study that was done with actually over it was a very large study, over 16,000 people, uh, sorry, 160,000 people, I think it was quite, it was, I think I've got that statistic right, um, uh, but we can check that. So um, it was a very large study that was done, 
And this was over a two year period of time. Um, now, also what we know about the statins is that they don't always you know, cause, uh, they don't always uh, reduce the uh, risk completely. Uh, there is uh, all cause mortality is reduced by 30%, major coronary event by 34, and CV, CV mortality by 35%. Uh, so there's still um, a lot of people that are out there that are taking statins that have not, you know, either reduced the LDLC sufficiently and are not completely out of risk. <clears throat> so we know this from established work in the literature. So these are the major risk factors for coronary artery disease, and some are modifiable and others are not. The modifiable ones are usually uh, like the LDLC and HDLC levels and triglycerides affected by the drugs, primarily the statins and also blood pressure medication. And also lifestyle can help modify uh, your cholesterol levels, as we well know. And then for non-modifiable, we have age, gender, ethnicity, and genetic factors, familial hypercholesterolemia. And so that's the kind of focus of this study here right now that I'm describing. So familiar hypercholesterolemia is actually affecting one in 250 people. It's caused by uh, genetic mutations in three genes primarily, and that's the LDL receptor, APOB, and uh, P -K PC PCSK9, um, which uh, uh, is, is involved in the recycling of the LDL receptor. So uh, the genetic, the, this genetic condition actually is quite, um, has quite an effect in, in both men and women. Uh, if you have this, you know, if you have familiar hypercholesterolemia, your chances of having a heart attack is uh, in, in females are 30% by the age of 60 and in males 50% by the age of 50. So that's quite a high uh, percentage rate. So looking at some of the LDLC levels we see here um, on this, uh, I don't know if I have a pointer here. Um, you can see how um, just in common hypercholesterolemia, which is without familial hypercholesterolemia, without the genetic mutations, it goes to about 190, from 130 to 190. Um, heterozygous obviously have much higher levels, and as you would expect, the homozygous would have even higher levels, they're super high, um, start from anywhere above 400 upwards. So uh, they're probably not, they're, obviously the heterozygous are more common than the homozygous, and you can also have compound heterozygous uh, that have some intermediate level as well. So um, in terms of what's been done, in you know, what happens is not just cholesterol, but what, what question we wanted to ask in this study is you know, what happens to the metabolome in these subjects or patients that have very high cholesterol or LDLC levels. And if you're looking in the literature, there's not actually much out there um, in terms of uh, the, the looking at wide coverage of the metabolome, most of the studies that have been done have been looking at lipoprotein particles. So I'm going to highlight three studies here, but this is one of them which looked at uh, metabolite profiling in children uh, with and without familiar hypercholesterolemia. And uh, it's not a very large study, 57 healthy children, 47 familial hypercholesterolemia cases. And they you know, showed what we would expect higher levels of the atherogenic apoB containing lipoproteins and lipids. And uh, also, they also show, show some changes in the HDL particle concentration. Um, this was done by NMR. In fact, all these studies were done by NMR. Uh, and this is another one that's looked in uh, patients with juvenile lupus. And again, here they saw some changes in small afro-protective uh, high-density lipoprotein subsets. And then a third, which was um, done in female subjects. Uh, and again, they showed uh, that they could actually identify subtypes of uh, hypercholesterolemia that were distinguished along two axes represented by triglycerides and LDL particle concentration. So um, other than that, there is really not a lot in the literature uh, unless we, you know, we kind of looked and tried to see what else is out there. So we, we took on a study which was uh, conducted here at Baylor, part of the Preventative Cardiology Registry. And uh, this was in Dr. Peter McCullough's clinic. And we collected samples um, over a period of several years, uh, 184 subjects and 20 healthy controls. The samples were biobanked and uh, until the time of analysis. Now we have a strict procedure protocol that we use for collecting blood in a standardized way. The samples were processed and times were recorded. Um, 
and also the times of the processing of the sample in terms of uh, uh, the uh, centrifugation, collection of the plasma and storing it. So all this was very tightly controlled and we eliminated any subjects that fell out of this protocol. So we made sure that we, because integrity of the sample is kind of everything in, in metabolomics. So this is a study design that we started with. Um, I'm gonna show you actually two sets of uh, study designs. This is one of the first, this is the first one, where we looked at these uh, PCR subjects, these preventive subjects that were in a preventative cardiology registry. And uh, we also had their ICD-10 ICD codes and they also all had genetic screening. So we had um, 28 subjects without dyslip dyslipidemia and we had 145 with dyslip dyslipidemia, but no familial hypercholesterolemia. And we had 15 subjects that had genetically confirmed. <clears throat> Most of those were on the uh, LDL receptor mutations and two were on ApoB. So the plasmas were collected, stored, but we separated them into two fractions, which one we performed the quant 500, the Biocrates quant 500 assay by LC and FIA MSMS. And the other sample we sent to Nightingale Health for NMR analysis. And uh, Nightingale Health has, has published many studies on their platforms as many studies have been published with the quant 500 as well. Um, but in terms of coverage, the quant 500, what we found, it, it, it can potentially detect 630 metabolites and 230 plus metabolic ratios or indicators, but we actually determined 570 metabolites and 189 metabolic indicators. So, uh, and there are over 23 different classes of compounds. So it's quite wide coverage. Um, the uh, NMR analysis also has good coverage, but not as wide. Uh, most of them are confined to lipid particles, the lipoprotein particles and the particle sizes. So first of all, I wanted to describe our data processing and statistics workflow. Um, our analysis on the SIAX quant 500, we obviously um, use MedIDQ and uh, analyst, well, analyst and MedIDQ to quantitate the metabolites. Then uh, the NMR data was provided to us by Nightingale. We then did a distribution normalization outlier processing, feature filtering, and then performed the generalized least square regression, which actually um, was adjusted for a lot of socio-demographic information, uh, comorbidities and medications. And the final result was the FDR adjustment with the Q-value method. So here's some of the first results that we got. Uh, this is a heat map of the top 50 metabolites that were significant across those three groups. No, dyslipi no dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia non-FH and FH. And we found that there were, uh, compared to the no dyslipidemia group, we found that there were 134 metabolites that were different versus dyslipidemia and 135 uh, with familial hypercholesterolemia. So if we break that down into the various classes, what we see here are on one side, the left side, the small molecules on the right side, the lipids, um, we can see that there are some amino acids and amino acid related compounds that are elevated. Not that many, but there are a few um, that show some alterations in metabolism. The major changes we saw were in acyl carnitines and the phospholipids, particularly the phosphatidylcholines, sphingomyelins, cholesterol esters, and also in the ceramides. And um, as we go down the triacylglycerols as well. Now, the group that had familial hypercholesterolemia had significant effects on the triglycerides, but the sample size was so small, they weren't statistically significant. So there are changes there. It's not like triglyceride metabolism was not altered in FH. It's just a statistical um, uh, issue on that one. So moving on from there, the, what we like a lot, uh, we kind of uh, use it quite a bit in our studies are the, metabol are the met metabolic indicators. And this um, you know, is a software that's provided by the Biocrates company, uh, Metabo Indicator. And for this, we saw uh, between these various groups that there were 22 metabolic indicators that were different between no DLP and DLP, and also 40 metabolic indicators that were different between familial hypercholesterolemia and no, no dyslipidemia. 
Um, I can't go possibly go through each metabolic ratio and describe exactly why, why you know, each one, what it means, it would take us too long, but I tried to kind of summarize it here. Um, if you can maybe see some of these changes uh, in red is the effect size. So what we see is the same classes of compound infected in dyslipidemia as in familial hypercholesterolemia, but in familial hypercholesterolemia, the effect size is much greater. And as we go down through these different classes, I tried to kind of summarize, again, there's a lot of detail in this, uh, in this slide, and there's a lot of detail you can pull out from, or uh, detailed information you can pull out from each of these ratios that can give us an idea of what's happening metabolically. But in terms of a global summary, um, on, on, a, on the right side, uh, it, it, you see in the boxes here, we tried to really just summarize some of the changes, sorry. Um, so there are changes in branch acids or in amino acids, in the classes of amino acids. We see that there are significant changes in nutritional status, also affects mTOR signaling and is associated with insulin secretion and resistance. Um, going down some of these acylcarnitines that are changed are significantly increased and the ratios are altered, uh, indicate that there is um, involvement with inflammation and oxidation of fatty acids. Um, I want to focus also on the uh, ceramides particularly because these are known to promote inflammation and induce cytokine uh, formation and, and contribute to plaque formation in the vessels. So these, these ceramides are now becoming very um, interesting molecules to look at in terms of risk and uh, prediction of cardiovascular events uh, in the human population. Obviously the cholesterol esterols uh, are elevated and PCs and sphingomyelins are also very important metabolically and play a role in atherosclerosis as well as in oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. For the NMR analysis of the same group, we see that um, there, are quite, there are quite significant changes. Now the NMR is quite involved because it looks at lipid compositions of 14 lipoprotein subclasses and each subclass has a different portion of, of uh, lipid that uh, is bound to, to that lipoprotein. So it gets quite complicated in that sense, uh, but there are significant changes. These are the number of uh, significant changes that we see, 104 in dyslipidemia versus no dyslipidemia and 120 that are changed between familiar hypercholesterolemia and dyslipidemia. Just a quick look at the box plots for these, um, showing LDLC, total free cholesterol, Remnant C, which is a very atherogenic lipid, um, cholesterol lipids, uh, and also ApoB. And then we also can confirm with NMR that the sphinger myelins are elevated, uh, as we had seen with the quant 500 uh, analysis that, that kind of is consistent. And then the changes in the branch chain amino acids. So these forest plots are actually kind of nice because they show at a glance some of the particle sizes and the changes that are occurring with the um, group that has no dyslipidemia as a comparison, that's the effect size of zero. Everything else is compared to that, the DLP and the FH groups. And we can see that this is for a total, um, uh, for the total of the uh, uh, cholesterols and triglycerides and phospholipids in the BLDL lipoproteins. But this is primarily driven from the small molecular weights or the sort of medium and small VLDLs. That's, that's where this is really driven from. And then of course the LDL is, is really quite much higher in the familiar hypercholesterolemia group compared to the dyslipidemia group, which is probably what we would expect, but um, these could also be significant markers. So um, going on, there's two other groups to look at. There's the intermediate, uh, density lipoproteins, which are significantly different. And then as we would expect, there's not much of a change in the HDL uh, forms there. So the second experiment that we kind of did with the data is look at it in terms of metabolic profiles based on LDLC levels. And again, this is a clinical classification that's used. If you go to get an annual checkup, you'll get a report back that will have these cutoffs and um, what we did is actually uh, group them into four groups, uh, combining the two highest levels, which is high and very high. 
and doing a comparison across these four groups. These are the numbers that we would get, that we, that we obtained uh, in terms of numbers of subjects, and we applied, and obviously we had the same analysis that we performed um, on there. And here we see the quant 500 metabolites in, across the four groups. So you can see quite nicely from the heat map that there are significant differences as you go from <clears throat> the lower level of LDLC up to the uh, very high and high levels, the borderline high and, and high levels. But even, even in the, uh, what's, what's interesting to focus on is that even in the above optimal range, which is where a lot of people in the population actually are, there are some significant changes in the metabolism and also in these lipoproteins that could be important biomarkers to search for uh, going forward in other studies. And if we look at this data in terms of the different classes of compounds that are affected, um, we see again, there are some uh, amino acids that are affected, particularly more in the familial, sorry, in the uh, very high cholesterol group, hypercholesterolemia group. But again, looking at uh, the lipids, we see high levels of uh, a high number of acyl carnitines that are affected in the very in a, in a very high group of uh, with uh, LDLC, but also in the uh, lysophosphatidylcholines, alcoholines, phosphatid alcoholines, as well as finger myelins, and also in the ceramides and uh, and uh, hexaceramides and trihexacyl ceramides. And again, here we have a high number of uh, triacylglycerols that are obviously affected and, and now showing to be very significant. Um, again, on uh, the, uh, quant on the metabolic indicators, we see a similar pattern, a uh, very high number of uh, indicators that are altered in the very high group as well as the borderline high and also in the above optimal. And again, looking at the forest plots uh, we, uh, of the liquid chromatography uh, portion, which is the small metabolites on the left side and then on the right side is mostly the flow injection analysis, which looks at the lipids, we can see that there are some marked changes. The indicators also point to changes in, uh, significant changes in the sphingomyelins as well as in the uh, ceramides that are, that are grouped down here. Uh, again, these are, these are all showing significant uh, changes there. Now for the NMR analysis, the effect is very dramatic for the lipoprotein particle sizes. Uh, going from optimal all the way to very high and high. Um, we see that there are quite a, almost uh, everything is affected across the board. And uh, if we look at the patterns from VLDL to LDL, we see that there are these marked changes. Now I should have just point out again that this is all driven by the medium sized VLDLs and the extra small and small size LDLs. Uh, BLDLs, but also on the um, sorry on the LDL side here, we see these major changes across these three groups in comparison to the optimal group. Um, these are all significantly higher, and so what 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 we really need to focus on is is you know which one of these um, particle sizes are most important and uh, how do they predict cardiovascular disease. Uh, again, finishing off with IDL and HDL, these are completely separated in, sorry, in the, um, in the, in the groups, they, they completely separate. So um, I also want to bring to attention one study that we performed, which is with a uh, monoclonal antibody PCSK9, which is a uh, pro-protein converter subtilistin kexin type 9, um, this is uh, fairly, uh, not relatively new, but it's been around for quite a few years. It actually uh, is involved in the recycling of the LDL receptors, but it's very effective in clearing cholesterol from the, from the blood in those subjects that are resistant to statin treatments. And uh, this was really a safety study that was done here at Baylor with Dr. Kara East, and uh, it's being published now in Kidney Medicine. Uh, and it's known to at least uh, reduce uh, LDLC levels by 50 to 70 percent, although we didn't see that great of effect. We actually looked in subjects that were uh, on dialysis for three months. They had an exclusion criteria of LDLC uh, less than 70, 
and they were given two doses, uh, well, they were given doses of um, uh, PCSK9 every two weeks for, for 12 weeks. And uh, it did lower LDLC levels. It did also lower um, triglyceride levels and uh, increased uh, slightly the HDLC. But we performed the quant 500 assay, both pre and post treatment. And what we found there is that this was associated, this treatment, which lowered the cholesterol, was associated with decreases in ceramides, cholesterol esters, obviously, and also the sphingomyelins, which are considered proaphrogenic. And uh, this could be, uh, this is an, another kind of confirmation that if we lower cholesterol, we can prevent some of these proaphrogenic accumulation of lipids. So in, in conclusion, um, we have mass spectrometry. We've used mass spectrometry, quant 500 a targeted metabolomic analysis uh, to look at several multiple lipid species, uh, which are affected in uh, dyslipidemia and also in familial hypercholesterolemia compared to the group without dyslipidemia. And then we've also seen that there are, these effects are also almost three times greater in the familial hypercholesterolemia group. Uh, we saw minimal changes in other metabolites, in the, in the non-lipid metabolites. We saw some minor changes in, in amino acids, but sorry, nothing significant. And then our NMR analysis uh, really uh, showed quite remarkable changes in increased concentrations of cholesterol, cholesterol esters, but also in, in some of the other uh, proaphrogenic causing BLDL, LDL, and intermediate IDL lipoprotein particles. Um, and again, uh, the lipid composition in antiephrogenic HDL was minimally affected, which is a little bit of a contrary to one of the studies that was published earlier on, where they did see some changes in HDL uh, lipid composition. Um, finally, uh, hypercholesterolemia for the hypercholesterolemia stratification of subjects, we, we saw that there were, of course, um, again, the same uh, characteristic uh, Lysopcs, PCs, PCs fingermalians, and, and ceramides that were affected as the LDLC levels were much higher. And we saw minimal changes in other non lipid metabolites, except for some increases in fatty acids, which again could be expected, and also in bile acids um, that were in the very high LDL group. So, um, also, NMR protein lipoprotein analysis showed increased levels of lipid classes. Uh, across all the particle sizes as we go higher with LDLC. And um, as a final conclusion and, and remark, um, we still really need to understand the full metabolic uh, implications uh, and in using uh, mass spectrometry and NMR for prediction of future cardiovascular events and clinical outcomes in these groups of patients. And that we should really be including more of this type of analysis in future epidemiological studies uh, as in terms of risk stratification, but also in clinical trials of cholesterol lowering therapies. So um, with, with that comment, I'll, I'll take some questions.